Can I tell you about Apex Five takeoff? And this is so cool. So we sowed the seeds, we hand it over to NASA, they go let load it into the Dragon, and then we stood on the other side of the Banana Wither. Just across from us, you could see that the Falcon 9, like, like refueling, the smoke started to come out the bottom. My boss was watching it live on, on the internet and just going, oh, it's going to go off any minute now. It's 10. And I knocked the phone out of her hand. No, look, no, it's there. It's taking off. There's a lag on the internet. And we look up and you just see this huge plume of smoke come out of the bottom of the rocket. And it lifts off so slowly. Like, I've seen Guy Fawkes and I, I've been to 4th of July rocket displays. They go really fast. Not these, like, um, not these, <laughs> uh, not the ones that are going to space. They lift off slow and ominous. And you can see the sound wave coming at you. People go, you can't see sound. No, no, you can. The water, like, splashes up. The mangoes in front of you start to, to shake. And then you feel it coming through the base of your heels and the back of your eyes. And then, whoosh, it hits the front of your face. And then you look again and the rocket is lifting off slowly slowly and then it's weird because the, the noise has completely consumed you you can't hear anything your ears are ringing and you look around you and everyone's behaving really weird like you see these um these two japanese gentlemen bowing to one another as their experiment goes off these like, american dudes give each other like high fives i saw my bosses kiss each other <laughs> um and there's this italian there's this italian guy the quiet one looking you always need to worry for those, the quiet ones he's looking and I look at him, I go, what are you looking for? He's like, the burn, the burn. And I look up and there's a moment when the rocket ignites again in the sky and it turns around, the, the burn, and then it flies back at you. Um, like, and it looks like Superman flying across the sky in the movies with the red and the white streaks. And it's kind of weird because you realize there's an intercontinental ballistic missile that's flying straight at you. And for the first time in human history, it's not a scary thought. You kind of, I had faith in like the, the engineers and the scientists that they had built it because I knew that rocket was going to fly, turn around, and land right before my eyes. And that moment as it comes down slowly, just as it goes down below the trees, boom, boom, the sonic booms hit you. And no one can prepare you for those sonic booms. Like, I played Street Fighter, I, I, I knew, well, I, I experienced sonic booms in computer games, but when it hits you live in reality, oh, I'm getting bruised pimples now just remembering it, I do it every time, which I love telling the story. But, like. If you ever get a chance to like watch one of those, uh, the Falcons take off, go for it. And soon when, when the Starship goes, oh, yeah, that, but that's a different story. If humanity is to become a multi-planetary species and have people living and working on the moon and on Mars, we need to ensure that we can grow food locally for them. We've had three successful space launches, and we're the first lab to say that the plants that we engineered for the space flight environment grew better than the wild type. Space is a stressful environment because of the lack of gravity. The Gilroy Lab studies how plants grow in space to better understand what it might take to have strong growth and good yields to support astronaut health. A lot of students at the University of Wisconsin have been involved in helping us explore the research that we're doing with NASA. We need to work with engineers and computer programmers to develop new tools in order to create stresses on Earth that replicate the spaceflight environment. This work can be used as a roadmap in the future to accelerate the adaptation of plants to the spaceflight environment. So I'm a, a molecular biology researcher, uh, a plant scientist and a bioinformatician. So I play computer games that extracts biological information from databases. Um, how did I get here in America doing this research with NASA? Well, I started off in high school in the UK, went to college um, as a first generation student. I didn't really have any advice from my uh, friends and family. And it was a quite a daunting process. And I learned as I went through the different stages as I went on to get my PhD and, and a postdoctoral research post in, in the US that my interests evolved uh, through the different stages. So starting off as an environmentalist, I became an agronomist, and then a molecular biologist, and then got into statistics. But life isn't always so linear and so like, like grayscale. It's actually a lot more colorful than that. So, so this journey actually took me around a lot of different places. Uh, I started in, in Norwich, uh, the CNS school, uh, and I went to Nottingham. I studied there as an undergraduate, which took me down to London to Rothamsted Research to do my PhD and stay at this old manor house. <laughs> uh, and then that catapulted me to America, to, to Madison, Wisconsin, where I had a project with the National Science Foundation investigating how plants perceive and respond to, to gravity. 
And this inevitably led to us doing research with at NASA at the Kennedy Space Center so we could send plants to the International Space Station to do experiments in microgravity. Um, so each of those different stages I had different skills I practiced. So in high school I was practicing fire juggling. Um, in order to improve this I did time-lapse photography and analyzed the patterns and this allowed me to improve. Um, I then took this skill to, to college and started using that time-lapse photography to look at plants growing and was able to do so in a reproducible fashion so could measure the size and color of the plants over time and this turned into research. This research took me to Rothamsted where I did a PhD looking at fluorescence images. So here you can see we're using a fluorescent reporter to look at the plant's uh, long distance systemic signaling system as it gets eaten by a tiny caterpillar. Um, and this skill here is essentially just still building on that time-lapse photography that I practiced when I was a high school student, just now with slightly more advanced uh, tools. Um, this then led to an interest in robotics. And I started working with students to, to build robots that would take photos of plants so that we could get time-lapse photography of them growing so we could then train computers and machine learning algorithms to, to measure them as they grow. Um, so we so we use this killer robot because it sometimes kills plants to um, train uh, artificial intelligence to measure uh, plant growth. This uh, ground research has led to a research program sponsored by NASA uh, looking at how plants respond to the spaceflight environment. The fun thing about working with NASA is you get lots of mission patches. Um, so I'm in the Gilroy lab. Uh, we work with a NASA program called Gene Lab and this we make computer tools such as Mango to make uh, information about the space station available to citizen scientists. Uh, our main goal is to grow plants for, for veggie in the veggie growth system to increase astronaut health. And as part of that, we've, got, we've uh, had a series of experiments that we call TOAST. TOAST stands for Test of Arabidopsis Space Transcriptome. So we grew Arabidopsis on the space station and looked at its transcriptome. That's all the genes that's responding in it. And we started assessing them to look for patterns that might help us create sustainable agro ecosystems in orbit. That led us to getting this, this TikTok project. This is uh, sponsored by Target. In this, we are targeting improved cotton through orbital cultivation. And we'll be um, uh, sending cotton seeds to the International Space Station this summer on SpaceX 22. Um, so one of the, the great things about this, it all grew from my passion for plants. And now we have a uh, regular blast offs to the International Space Station thanks to SpaceX and these, the new era of um, aerospace exploration. Um, so, so finally, um, it all stems back to a passion for nature uh, and the space station gives us an opportunity to look back down on Earth and see things from a different perspective. So this is time-lapse photography performed from the International Space Station showing the loss of the aerial sea as a result of cotton irrigation in the former Soviet Union. Um, so now we can use technology to reflect on our impact on Earth and we can create new technologies to change the way we impact on Earth in the future. Uh, this is why we've been developing new imaging technologies to share with, with teachers and have the collaborative science environment to make these research tools available to our collaborators and, and peers uh, at NASA and around uh, the world. Uh, on our astrobotany website, we've been developing educational materials. So if any of you are teachers or students want to learn more about how to grow plants in space, you can find us through this web resource. Um, and so I'm happy to uh, answer any questions um, moving forwards. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Richard. That was really interesting um, and a great little insight into what you do and kind of how much is involved um, and what that actually means in the science world. Um, so what I'd like to do now, and I think you touched on a few of these themes throughout your talk, but um, is just think about these three themes that these students are focusing on. So one is detective glowworms, so thinking about the importance of ecosystems. We've got wildlife wonder, wonderlands, so thinking about, again, kind of diverse ecosystems and supporting life on the planet. And then emission eraser, which I think you touched on there, so kind of the impact on humanity on the planet. So can you just touch on those three themes and how that might fit into your work? 
Yeah, I'm going to number two first, like the, the diverse ecosystems theme. Um, so that's, that's something that's actually really close to my heart. Um, we, uh, a, a more diverse ecosystem is more sustainable. And that's true both in the, the biological systems and economic systems. But when we look at the space station, we have a completely artificial ecosystem that's been made uh, within our lifetime. It's really neat. It's a really interesting research-like uh, situation. What happens when you create this new ecosystem outside of like the Earth's like uh, magnetic sphere? Uh, and then how will the communities inside that change over time with all those extra intergalactic cosmic rays going through them and all the other like pressures associated with just being a built environment with lots of astronauts going through all the time? Um, it's a really interesting situation, really novel. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is we worked with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory to uh, access the space station microbiome and we made it available for our website with a graphical user interface. So biological students can go in there and poke around and look at different locations like the advanced exercise resistance device or, or maybe the dining room table and then you can look at the, the microbial population that lives there and start to postulate about like what factors might be influencing that. Um, and so that's Project Mango. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a look and see kind of like concept. Like in this modern era, we've got all these big omics databases, all these big ways of looking at all the diversity of life. And so just like looking at the patterns that already exist can actually really um, tell you a lot and help inform future experiments that you might want to do. Um, so for example, if like me, you think of the space station as a place where you can grow crops, you might want to think about the microbes that would grow with those crops. So you have to think of it as like a holistic system. And mm -hmm. so maybe you might want to introduce some beneficial microorganisms to the, the root biosphere to help the plant grow better and produce more sustainable yields. Um, in order to do that, like maybe like NASA has loads of regulations, you know, maybe they won't want to put new microbes up that aren't already up there. So making the space station microbiome available through the Mango database means that researchers like, like me or like you can go there, root around, find some interesting microbes, and then design experiments that you can do on the space station uh, because you know that they're already up there so you won't be like sending up any new kind of pathogen that might scare people. Amazing thank you um, and we've got a lot of questions to ask you but uh, is there anything else you wanted to say specific on those themes before I move on to the questions? Um, there was one other theme wasn't there was the first theme of creating mini ecosystems. Um, uh, yeah okay so that's that's um, another good one uh because uh, it actually feeds into my next project um so as i mentioned earlier uh, i should, as we went through give me one second let me go to this slide to present mode um so so earlier as i showed you like the, the stages of life that i've been through i didn't show you the next stage of life i'm hoping to go into um which is the <laughs> which is the, the principal investigator stage uh, so in the future, one, no, one hopes to set up one's own research lab, and, and it's kind of a daunting process to go out there in, into the wilderness alone, right? <laughs> um, and so in order to do so, I've, I've had to design a new experiment, and I'm proposing it to, to NASA, and um, hopefully, well, fingers crossed, you never know, it, it's like flying, buying a lottery ticket, but the project is an, an aquatic ecosystem. The good thing about aquatic ecosystems is anyone can make them. You can make them at home. Um, essentially, you just fill a, a, a mason jar with, with water and select your species wisely. So I've been looking at different aquatic plants that grow rapidly in aquatic ecosystems. And I've become really interested in, in duckweed. Uh, so there's these different varieties, Lemna, Wolfinia, Londoltia. But um, I'm also really intrigued by this thing called Azola. Azola is this nitrogen fixing fern that you can find uh, in paddy fields. It, and so I've been playing about with these at the moment. So the more the story is anybody can play around with their own mini uh, micro ecosystem. And these aquatic ones offer a, a new uh, way to kind of play with plants and get to know them. If you're interested in, the green, in this Green Companions project, you can collaborate with me and you can share photos for a new citizen science project I'm starting up. And we'll share the link with that later. Mm, uh, passion. Um, you've just got to do what you're really interested in. Uh, what was it? <clears throat> Someone once said, if, if you really, if you practice something every day for 10 years, um, you, get, you get good at it. Uh, and so there was a few things I wanted to do. One of them was like fire dancing. <laughs> um, that evolved into capoeira and like martial arts and performance dance and those types of like cultural um, forms of expression that help develop uh, character and confidence. 
Um, at the same time as that, it's just like my passion for plants and then applying that same kind of like drive to growing plants as many different ways as possible. <clears throat> um, and then on the way, never, underest never underestimating the importance of the people that you meet. It's, it's the journey that you go on. As I um, showed you earlier, those the map of the different locations that I went to. I went to those places because of mentors that I was able to find through academia. Like um, the degree isn't that important. Like the paperwork is irrelevant. It's the people that you meet along the way. Um, that's what takes you to your next adventure. Mum. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, we used to we used to play a game like where you dig a hole in the garden and you had to put the plant in it and, and fill it with soil. Mm. It's until I realised my mum was putting me to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I got to meet a scientist too. Um, so I, I realised it wasn't just like, growing plants because they're beautiful or, or growing plants because they're like they're tasty. Um, I was also just growing plants because they're like intrinsically interesting and if you look close enough at them you find these new patterns that you um either you overlooked uh, again that's why i got so passionate about time lapse photography because you get to see them move mm. like in, in a different in a different way you know um uh they work at a different speed to us but they they have to respond to the same environment as us so like their circadian rhythm their oscillations as they go through the day is intrinsically uh, defined in their genomes just like us is in us and so when we put those things in in a place where they don't have the same day-night cycles as us, and they don't have those same things like gravity. Like, how does the circadian rhythm like get out of sync? Uh, and how does the, the knowledge of how that works in plants affect humans and vice versa? Because when we look at the genetics of all organisms that like, NASA put in the space flight, we see the circadian rhythm is, is responding in all of them. And so it was not just my passion for plants, but my passion for knowledge and, how, and the, the way all these things interlink. And that's kind of what got me into genetics, kind of seeing through the things as being like, independent entities and essentially seeing everything's being interlinked by like strings of information um but that Amazing. abstract mm -hmm. oh being away from home you know it's hard working in a different continent i mean it's fun to go exploring but when you're in high school you know everyone wants to get out of your hometown and you like you always want to go traveling and go see the world and 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 going around india was like eye-opening I, I really enjoy traveling but like to, to do really advanced research, you also have to like settle down and really focus. Like each of the different institutes that I went were like often a remote field institute. So that's where you're able to really focus in your, like, your area. Um, like a lot of people that I know that are like hoping to be astronauts one day have to go to like deep caves and, and up to like the, the volcanoes of Hawaii in order to like get to space light analogs. Like, and so the people that are really passionate about like different fields have to, have to go that extra mile and often have to leave their comfort zone where their friends and, and family are. Earth, because it's got lots of plants on it. Um, uh, the the landmass spreading, well, yeah, definitely on Mars because it used to have water and now it doesn't. So it's landmass um, was a lot less a while back and now it's 100%. So we can learn a lot by comparing and contrasting those two planets. Not really, no. Um, to be honest, you can add certain like like treatments to make plants grow better up there, certain chemicals. Uh, yeah, and it, it depends on where you mean in space. Uh, there's certain chemicals on the surface of Mars that make it really hard to grow plants up there, and so you could remove those with the right chemicals. We build a big metal box around it and then we send up air from Earth that gets compressed in Florida and then we fill that metal box with Floridian air uh, and then we send humans up there in like SpaceX capsules who then um, put like water onto seeds uh, below uh, purple lights. Um, looking at the stars, uh, I think actually it was the south of France. I just got away from like light pollution, like because I grew up in a city, and it was amazing. I looked at all the different stars, like wow, it has to be life out there, infinite. Mm, wow. Okay, yeah, it's got a good ones there. Um, or, uh, what if gravity on Earth increased? Well, for plants, we've we've, sent, we've spun plants in, in centrifuges and um, fired them in rockets, and so both of those like situations are hypergravity. 
Uh, so that's how we research. So we, I think of gravity as being on a, a continuum. Here on Earth, we've got 1G. On space station, we've got micro Gs. And then when we spin stuff or fire things off a rocket, we have hypergravity. Um, and so this is what would happen if, if like Earth had a more dense metal core and how would the plants respond? Um, well, their leaves would all flop down, wouldn't they? Um, one of the things we found when we uh, put the plants in a centrifuge and fired them on a, on a rocket was that they started to activate their defense system. Um, so too much gravity is, is like you're being crushed. It's like you're being squeezed. Like no one likes to be crushed, even plants. And so if the earth suddenly just got uh, much denser and, and gravity increased, um, the plants would activate their defense system. This is so food, your, your next salad would be more bitter. Um, it would be, uh, wouldn't be as tasty. Um, and there was a second part of that question, so I missed the book. <laughs> yeah, the first bit was, why is evolution important to astronomy and astrobiology? Um, nothing makes sense in absence of evolution. Uh, evolution, it just, everything is built on that. Like, you see it everywhere, even outside of biology. Like, uh, it's this pervasive pattern this in everything, everywhere. Uh, it's beautiful. Both. Is it unnatural to have a machine, like, growing your plant? Ooh, that's, mm, that's that's a philosophical question like I'll leave them to answer that one but um uh, I like to do both uh, you can't you can't replace a farmer like the farmer is the most important part of, of the the agro ecosystem um, I'm a huge proponent of, of, of organic farming and have like formed an organic farming cooperative like since moving to the US uh, it but um, I also appreciate high tech high technology and uh, you need more space for or, uh, organic agriculture. And so when we are sending people to the moon bases and when we go on to Mars, we're going to be needing more intense uh, agro ecosystems and more intensive management. Uh, also, a lot of people think that we, we need to have that agro ecosystem functioning before we send humans. So you could imagine wanting to build robots and design robots that could establish your, your farm. Um, so that your farmers, when they, your astronauts, when they get there, are more involved in harvesting uh, and then re-sowing. Uh, and that could be a, a really important niche if we're going to establish these extraterrestrial colonies. Depends how good your, your spaceship is. And uh, so a really interesting concept is, let's take Venus. Um, most people always think of Mars as, as like the place to go because it's like, you know, rock. And, and JPL has done such a good job of landing robots on it. But um, humans and life, as we know, has always had 1G operating on us, a gravity at 1G, like as we have here on Earth. Um, if you go to Venus, you could create a, a space station or a, an airplane that kind of essentially flies at a height that gives you 1G. You wouldn't actually need to go down to the surface. Uh, it's like one of the things you see in like uh, science fiction in, in Star Wars, like the, the sky city kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, it depends on, on the, the, the spaceship that they build and, and the colonization strategy that on those explorers and, and use. Mars, it's always been the first goal, like since like the Victorian era, people have like dreamt and postulated and written novels and um, about it. And it's just uh, only in like, like post-World War II, Von Braun, like then wrote the equations that show it's physically possible to get there. Um, and then over the recent uh, decades, people have been looking at like the, the economic and impacts and the ways of doing it, the mechanisms of doing um, so the movies from like the governments being the driving force now to like private enterprise being the driving force. This, the next space race uh, is going to be uh, between private companies, not nations. Robotics, yeah, clever programming. That's why we need a really good education programs who train like students in how to um, like program Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and how to solve together the, these circuitries and think outside of the box because um, the technologies that we're developing for these extraterrestrial ecosystems are also going to make agri ecosystems on Earth more sustainable, particularly in the, the built urban environment. It's going to be really important of, of the future food chain, trying to find ways to do it locally um, all seasons. And um, so a lot of these technologies and things that we need for outer space, we also need for our, our cities uh, moving forward. Well, um, uh, it depends a lot on the rocketry technology. So at the moment with the Falcons um, taking off, we can get to low Earth orbit and do some really awesome stuff on the International Space Station. But space explorers want to get to the moon. It's, it's, we're, we're about to enter a stage of robotic exploration. I like to call it the robotic lunar Olympics. <laughs> um, 
uh, the, the, the feat that the Chinese government did getting the, the lunar to, rover to the dark side of the moon, which is brilliant. Um, I'm really excited by that next era of robotic exploration. What we really want is boots on the grounds. We want like a permanent settlement there. ESA has got plans on how to do it. And essentially, uh, once Blue Origins has its um, lunar lander operating, we will see an, like an Amazon delivery surface to the moon. That's essentially why Jeff Bezos founded um, Blue Origins and Amazon, he says, so that he could build a moon base. Um, so it all depends on the scale and timing and ambition of humanity. And that's kind of why we need this next generation of students to uh, dream big and dream bold and uh, aim for the moon. Um, how, usually from humans breathing out, uh, the International Space Station actually has slightly elevated CO2 relative to what you'd expect in, in the room that we're sitting in. Um, and so that's actually one of the factors that we have to deal with when we're doing our experiments uh, and sort of follow-up experiments. So, um, yes, most of the CO2 they get is probably has been exhaled by the astronauts. That's actually why growing plants in space is such an important thing. Like, uh, if we could scale up the field that we had attached to the space station, we can essentially create a biogenitive life support system where we use the plants as part of a, a closed loop ecosystem, which takes out the, the chemicals and that humans give off and, and then essentially repurposes those to make useful things that we can then breathe and eat. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it depends which hardware you use to grow the fruit, but that's really technical. Um, uh, Okay, so it's, but it's not such a crazy question. Um, essentially, when you, what you see when you look at all the different like studies, you do like a broad meta-analysis, not just of plants or of humans and animals stuff too. You see that there's a concept of accelerated aging that appears to be prolific in, as a generic pattern in, in space flight. So you imagine, so now you think of a plant growing from a seed to shoots, as it grows and it develops, it starts to flower and it produces fruit. So it's gonna go through the experimental stages faster. Um, and we're just starting to see that now. We have this new piece of uh, plant growth hardware called the Advanced Plant Habitat. And so this is like one of the first times a scientist has had a chance to do like long-term uh, studies and look for all the different stages. And those patterns are just about to be published um, by some, some peers in, in the field. So it's, it's a hot qu question, it's a hot topic. Um, and I put this to you, um, uh, fruit trees in space. What about dwarf fruit trees? What if you could like make them really small? So there's some genetically modified varieties of plum that, where they've overexpressed a gene called flowering time. And that makes that plum tree act like a vine and just constantly fruit. Uh, I think there's, that's a really hot area of um, future exploration. Um, and not just in space, on, on Earth too. Wouldn't you like to have one of those ever-fruiting plums in your basement or, or your garden? Mm. Well, well, so far it was the SpaceX um, 13 launch. Uh, we call it Project Apex 05. So every um, NASA project has an often on uh, a code name for the project. Apex 05 was the opportunity that I had to accompany uh, Dr. Swanson and Dr. Gilroy to the Kennedy Space Center, where we did an experiment where we sent a plant called Arabidopsis thaliana to the International Space Station, and it grew on orbit for eight days. And the astronaut Scott Tingle took photos every day allowing us to see like the physiological development and, and measure that over time. Uh, he then fixed the samples in uh, a chemical fixer dip and froze it to minus 80 degrees and they sent it back down to us in the, the dragon capsule and we were then able to get that, those samples back and analyze the genetic pattern. And so to kind of go through this, this experience has just been awesome. Um, really cool. So the atmosphere is the key part there. How do you make sure the plants have the right atmosphere? So the conclusion to again to a, to a meta-analysis of many different space like studies is that plants appear to drown in space. Like the air doesn't move around properly. Like on Earth, hot air rises because it gets less dense and then cold air settles. But then that's all driven, and actually it's convection, uh, and that's all driven by gravity. So when we go to the International Space Station, we don't have that convection, we don't have gravity. So the air doesn't move around. So we quite often see the plants activating their heat shock response system. And um, essentially starting to act like they're being flooded, like, like they're drowning. Um, and so essentially we were now able to work with engineers, provide this information to them, help them develop better ways for moving like the gases and the fluids around them. At the same time, we can also look for like a biological um, solution to this situation, which is like start to find varieties of crops that do better in, in flooded environments. Uh, 
Finally, we, did, we also demonstrated the genetic engineering approach on, on that Apex05 study, where we targeted a, a single gene that's involved in a plant's systemic defense system, its nervous system, and we were able to desensitize part of the plant to that flooding stress. So, that's, so there's many different options that are available. Um, uh, the next thing that we're testing actually is adding microbes. Instead of genetically modifying the plants to be resistant to the flood, adding certain types of microbes that confer that same like uh, characteristic. And we'll be testing that in orbit in a couple of years. Just got to uh, just got to get the protocol working right in this thing. Yeah, generally speaking, um, the goal is to try and make it so there is no limiting characteristic. That, that's kind of the goal. And that's essentially what the advanced plant habitat was designed to do. It, it can control everything. It can take chemicals out of the air like ethylene and, and, and it can add them too. So it can control the oxygen and CO2 levels inside. It's awesome. It's so cool. Um, but it's also kind of really big and noisy. And so, so you can use engineering solutions to make sure you have the perfect environment for your specific crop. But then you also then get what we call monocultures because you've designed the environment to, to be specific about one type of plant. And if that any one of those characteristics then get, fails for some reason, if that piece of hardware breaks, that crop is going to probably suffer. Um, so I kind of also like the organic approach. Like historically speaking, we had more like intercropping systems and mixed agriculture. So if one crop failed, another one still survived. So you always got something back out of it. I think there's a lot of value in like the traditional land races that you, you see in like indigenous cultures. Um, and so I, I think looking at uh, underutilized crop species is a really like important area for future research. Um, yes, yeah, so if you try to go bamboo in space, because if there's no gravity, like the cell wall structure is different, so it kind of stretches more. Um, so you might, so you can imagine the timber industry in space where your plants are growing faster, uh, but anything made in space, in my opinion, should probably stay in space. Like you can imagine space manufacturing for a moon base. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of space on Earth. Like um, it's not really, we could, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't see us growing food um, in orbit and then delivering that down to Earth on a space elevator anytime soon. Uh, I plan on achieving these end goals by training the next generation of researchers and students and engineers to create, create the next level of, of tools and crops that can overcome the challenges that I see in, in the patterns and the data that's currently been generated by, by NASA researchers and researchers worldwide. It's a good question. Um, so there's this project, project called the Wisconsin Fast Plant Program. And there's this guy, um, Paul Simon, who's brilliant, beautiful little professor. And he actually um, uh, has this whole lesson plan about how you can fertilize plants with these little like, imitation bees. Uh, and essentially that they've done that on orbit too. So, so some plants require fertilization um, across pollination like that. Uh, my friend Jacob uh, Torres, he's gonna, it's part of a program at Kennedy Space Center to grow um, chilies on the space station. It's part of the Space Chili Challenge. And they're now investigating different pollination strategies of those too. Um, sometimes they will just self-pollinate themselves. Sometimes in the field, there's insects that go around and do that kind of job. And so now they've got um, school children and, and researchers across the world trying to do their own little like pollination tests. Like, is there like a specific pattern or specific, specific buzzing frequency that you can do to to help chili peppers um, self-pollinate? And then the the NASA researchers are going to try uh, the most successful one um, in orbit this this summer. Uh, around I think sources so both scope on SpaceX 22, the same time as our cotton experiment. So, um, uh, so yes, yeah, so pollination in, in space is a really interesting concept. The best way to get around it is to select varieties that self-pollinate. The most important ash, uh, aspect of astrobotany and, bi and biology is basically making people appreciate how wonderful plants are and how much we actually use them for. Like, they're often just like in the corner of the room, like a lot of people think they don't do much, but like they, they really do, um, yeah. So appreciation for the nature of plants and, and actually trying, um, spending time trying to nurture them and look after them in your local environment, uh, I think is the most important thing that, uh, that I've learned from, from being a plant astrobotany kind of researcher. Yeah, well, well people in, in Holland have done studies um, using like Martian regolith and they have got like 
um, regolith is like a NASA term for like their space soil. Um, so it doesn't have any like organic matter in it. It's uh, and the the Martian version is is red, and they were able to grow um, plants in it. They had to add in some more organic matter, and they had to add in some uh, some worms. And so yeah, worms will grow in there quite happily. Like uh, I know a researcher from the University of Nottingham has been growing nematodes, microscopic worms, really small ones, uh, on the space station, and and um, in centrifuges to look at the responses to hypergravity. Uh, and so there's an active area of research to see how worms would do in areas of altered g forces. But essentially, yeah, we believe they'll work. They'll quite happily in, in Martian soil and, and lunar lunar regular. Um, the key there would be to introduce some organic matter, um, and that's why I like duckweed. Uh, I think these small companion plants you, you could flood like your field of um, Martian regolith or, or lunar regolith. You can get your exponentially growing aquatic plants on the surface. Um, essentially, you can then drain that ecosystem. Those those aquatic plants will rot and provide that hummus organic matter that your your plant roots need to, to grow. And then you could sow your crops maybe in, in a lava tunnel on the moon or Mars um, three decades from now. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop the questions there. And I'd just like to end it by asking you to share some final advice that you've got for these students if they're interested to get into a similar field to yours. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's never linear. Like you see a lot of people go, I want to work in aerospace. And um, uh, and maybe that works for some people, but um, it's it's more about developing uh, the skill sets that are related to it, uh, and uh, and then if you're lucky, like the planets align. Um, it's just about following your passion. I think I think that's the most important thing. Uh, and if your only passion is to go to the moon, um, <laughs> well, well, good luck. I mean, it is possible for some people in your generation. Um, but like, uh, there's a lot of other awesome things that are, that are part of that journey. And um, it, it's, it's, it's so much fun just being part of the production. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And can you just briefly describe the Space Chili Challenge that we're going to be sending out to these students to participate in? Yeah, sure. So um, my friend Jacob Torres, uh, he's I founded the Space Chili Challenge. So he's working at the Kennedy Space Center as part of the, the Veggie program uh, for astronaut health. And so he's going to be the first one of the, the, his team going to be the first people to grow uh, chilies on the International Space Station in the, the veggie, uh, so in the advanced plant habitat. And so as part of this, what they want to do is, is see what they can learn from other scientists around the world um, through having lots of people do their own ground control. So essentially, he's willing to send seeds to anybody and everybody that's involved. There's now like thousands of participants around the world. And you can join this program too. So if you reach out, uh, there'll be some links uh, shared. He will then send you the same variety of seeds, uh, the exact same batch they're going to the space station. Um, what we are then doing, researchers around the world, some in Sheffield, some in uh, Kennedy Space Center, or some in Japan. What we're all doing is trying to do our best to build a, a built environment, to build a hydroponic system with lights and, and document how we do it and share that information with the researchers at Kennedy Space Center. And then we're going to share data about the plants and try and see if we can find some patterns. If, if we all collaborate together, will we see some certain trends that kind of um, pop out? Mm -hmm. um, similarly to that, at the same time, we're, not, we're just uh, in the next year, we're launching the, the Space Microgreen Challenge. Uh, we don't have a launch date for the microgreens in space. That's why it's, it's on the back burner, so to speak, because it's really great to tie these two things together. But essentially that same kind of principle, like perhaps you students, you, you teachers, you might want to like grow some crops in the same way that astronauts are going to be doing and, and microgreens are that other opportunity. Uh, and so again, we'll be sharing the link to the, uh, to the microgreen uh, challenge to go along with the Space Chile challenge. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Some really exciting opportunities there and some really interesting insights into your career and your research.